Hi, and welcome back to another episode of The Public Law, right here on TammyPepperman.org. We are listener-supported, reader-supported. If you'd like to donate, please visit us at TammyPepperman.org and click on our donate button under the No Borders radio player. And every little bit helps. It goes to our web development, Tamworth Web Development, and uh, that's what keeps us here. Do I have you both? Maybe. Great. Yeah, okay, I'm here. Yep, let's see. Uh, the public law and uh, radio presentation here of the latest news and events and things going on as it relates to fallout here from the court case where we Declared them all civilly dead this time. I think that, that show Z Nation, you ever see Z Nation? Oh, yeah. I, mean, I think that's I think that's what happens to Congress when you declare them civilly dead. They're just running around and they're all just zombies. And They were before that. Okay. And the human beings that are left are just showing them mercy. Absolutely. And, um, you know, the, the, the greatest depiction so far, I think, has been the strain. That one um, really resonates with me. As to what Congress really is. Well, I miss the. Uh, they abruptly ended. Beware the Batman, for uh, the uh, cartoon lovers out there. I thought that one was pretty good, but then again, it was always it was always a. Uh, there was still that uh, element of uh, crime that. Uh, Batman was considering uh, to be crime, like commercial crime still. So, I don't know. I, I kind of like the artwork and uh, Beware the Batman, but uh, the next Batman definitely has to adhere to the public law. That's all there is to it. Now, have you seen Transformers? The newest one? Yes. That one was so much indoctrination. I mean, that was like over the top. FBI pointing fingers all around, the corporate government pointing fingers all around, being the same creator of the same, uh, you know, killer or killing techniques. And um, I, I thought it was very profound to see um, in this day and age that an attempt would be made, and in that attempted evidence is uh, fourth generation warfare. And I, I thought that was very, very interesting. Yeah, he could have um, done without some indoctrination, but uh, beautiful movie. It's well produced. It is, but the indoctrination is is uh, extremely concerning. Well, did you get a chance to watch that uh, South Park episode? Oh yeah, yeah. It was uh, quite the episode. It's one of my favorite shows, by the way. I love well, they exposed the production, I think, on the medical industrial complex, or all of them, anyways, really. Absolutely. The gluten. The FDA yeah. comes in as the feds, you know. We're the feds. <laughs> the FDA. Food pyramid. But if you think about it, all of these organizations like the FDA, uh, Oh my goodness, so many of them, IRS, are buying guns, just like, uh, you know, any other division of the Congress's military, like the FBI, and, you know, they've all seemed to be headed towards the same direction, to where they're, you know, looking more and more like the same entity all the time. Absolutely, and, and they really are. When you get into the um, Black Saw Dictionaries, of course, and, and uh, I prefer the first when you're getting to the foundations of things, 1891. Um, you look up such as the definition of bureau, quote, an office for the transaction of business. That doesn't sound like an investigative service, does it? FBI, Federal, Federal Bureau of Investigation. Well, well you, their business has always been uh, human trafficking. Human so. trafficking. And, um, you know, of course, bureaucracy stems from that. And uh, 
it is a system in which the business of government is carried on in departments, each under the control of a chief, in contradistinction from a system in which the officers of government have a coordinated authority. It's very, very interesting because then when you scroll on down and you look up the uh, definition for cabal, it's a small association for the purpose of intrigue or intrigue. His name was given to that ministry in the reign of Charles II, formed by Clifford Ashley, Buckingham, Arlington, and Lauderdale, who concerted a scheme for the restoration of property. Then he shows of these five names from the form the word cabal. Hence the appellation, and that comes, of course, from him. And a cabalist in French commercial law, a factor or a broker. And of course, you you want to go down into shipping. You this is all uh, piracy here, and uh, definition out of Black's Law for sedition of cartel. Of course, is an agreement between two hostile powers. For the delivery of prisoners or deserters, and of course you'd like to look into the 1929 Geneva Convention just before these little rat bastards went bankrupt. And uh, of course the uh, cartel ship is a vessel commissioned in time of war to exchange the prisoners of any two hostile powers. And that's exactly what Congress is doing constantly. Yeah, Congress is what Congress does. Absolutely. And see, I see Biden today uh, slip some expletive in a speech or something today. Oh, and then t this afternoon he was claiming that the United States Incorporated allies have been helping ISIS. Duh, but uh, it looks like he's rolling on his peers, perhaps. He is the president of the Senate, after all. Like, as if he didn't know these things before. <laughs> he had no idea what was going on. President, or Vice President Biden, he had no idea. <laughs> these are interesting days. Well, let's see, um, I guess taking a look at the news, emails reveal Pennsylvania Supreme Court Justice was sending porn to an employee of the state attorney general's office as governor faces a widening scandal in the Daily Mail. Wow. Governor, governor Tom Corbett served as attorney general from 2005 to 2011. When the emails were sent, emails contained centerfold nudes, sex tapes, and off-color jokes, as well as mundane pet advice and praise for the troops. Two staffers, Christopher Abruzzo, Environmental Protection Secretary under Corbett, and Glenn Pardo, a lawyer with the Department of Environmental Protection, have already resigned. The emails first came to light during an inner internal review of Jerry Sandusky production by now Attorney General Kathleen Kane. Um, it's interesting. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, the Sandusky prosecution, which it is a production, but I guess it was a Freudian slip. Uh, a scandal over pornographic emails being shared by employees at the Attorney General's office spilled over to another department when it was revealed some porn emails were sent from a state Supreme Court Justice. The Allentown Morning Call reviewed 54 emails sent from Justice Seamus McCaffrey's personal Comcast email address to an employee at the state Attorney General's office and found at least eight contained pornographic images and videos. Revelation that McCaffrey sent pornographic laced emails, email chains, comes as Governor Tom Corbett is facing scrutiny for pornography, pornography being forwarded within the state's attorney general's office during his tenure there. Absolutely, that's exactly what they do. 28 U.S.C. The Judiciary. 
is a routing system. It stems from the 1789 Judiciary Act, and it's a means of trafficking human beings. Part of that, of course, is trafficking children amongst themselves and each other. That was their former function before it was brought to light, of course, by the evidence, and they were found guilty of genocide and human trafficking last year, and, and now what we're seeing is the accountability. And, and this is all essentially that uh, same idea that the FBI was formed under Hoover with the pedagogy. Right, and, and it was it was there before that, just as much as the Central Intelligence Agency was uh, Central Intelligence Group, um, you know, they were all think tanks. Well, when one of those think tanks wants to make itself, quote, legitimate, you know, Congress is there to legitimize it. It's there to promote it as an act of Congress or promote it as a department or promote it as another bureau, an arm of Congress. But it's all the same business. It's just the different mechanisms of the same business. Now, let's see, it goes on to say the emails that the state attorney general's office turned up during an internal review. Oh, we, oh, we already did that. Where did I leave off? Uh, yeah, let me, uh, <laughs> as soon as I figure out where I left off here on this thing. It's just been a really profound week. I was traveling and, you know, it, it, these things are... It, we're seeing now are, are you know it's it's quite amazing you know so yeah so these turn up during an internal review of the Jerry Sandusky child sex abuse scandal um, let's see a staff under corporate during his tenure as attorney general from 2005 2011 requested his past emails at Kane's request when a routine screening uncovered some questionable content. Subject lines like devotion and courage, top emails containing pornographic images of women loosely playing on that theme. There were also sex tapes and off-color but otherwise harmless jokes. After news of the emails came to Kane, both Corbett and State Supreme Court Chief Justice Ronald Castle asked for copies of the change to determine whether members of their departments were involved. Members of the media also submitted right-to-know requests, and late in September, Kane shared emails from the inboxes of eight former staffers at the Attorney General's office. All eight men worked under Corbett during his tenure as Attorney General, with some following him to his administration. Two of the owners of those inboxes, Christopher Abruzzo, Environmental Protection Secretary under Corbett and Glenn Parno, a lawyer with McCaffrey's, uh, a lawyer with the Department of Environmental Protection, have resigned. McCaffrey's emails were revealed Wednesday by morning call as coming from the batch show by Kane, shown by Kane. Well, and there's, what, five more that are coming down the pike because each one of those is inspector generals. They're holding everything in check for the judiciary. They're the ones that protect everybody and use the FBI to protect these pedophile judges and these disgusting attorneys that are trafficking men, women, and children. Uh, let's see here, it's finishing it up, but I guess the justice forwarded emails with titles like tan lines, XXX, depicting news centerfolds, though only eight messages were found with lewd content. Two more had off-color jokes, but others were filled with mundane pet advice or political jokes about President Obama and Reagan. These messages were forwarded to a member of Corbett's Attorney General's office and uh, then sent onto a circle of former members of Philadelphia Police, where McCaffrey served for 20 years before becoming a judge in 1993. Justice McCaffrey has so far declined to speak about the emails. Penn Live reports that if the emails were stored by members of the Attorney General's office, it would be in violation of the office policy, uh, office's police of 
appropriate use of computer resources. Yeah. I think it's supposed to say policy, but it says offices police. Yeah. That's a mouthful. That is um, from, again, that's from the Daily Mail. And let's see here. Got a married high school math teacher, 27, admits to having sex with at least four teenage students in her home and SUV. Stafford County High School teacher may face additional charges following allegations that she was having a sexual relationship with a 17-year-old student. The sheriff's office announced Tuesday, Erica Mesa, a math teacher and coach at Colonial Forge High School, has been charged with three counts each of custodian indecent liberties and solicitation of a minor using the a computer device. School administrators received an anonymous phone call about the sexual relationship. Mesha, 27, was allegedly having with the male student in February, May, and September of 2014. School officials say the allegations were also posted on a social media site. After being charged with having sex with one student, 27-year-old Erica Mesa admitted to as many as four partners at Colonial Forest High School in Virginia. And these were all off the front page of the Daily Mail today, actually. School principal and assistant had charged with failing to report teacher who was having an affair with pupil despite knowing about it for six months. Principal and assistant principal of Stanford High School were charged Thursday with failing to report an inappropriate relationship with an English teacher and an 18-year-old student, police said. Roth Norton, Roth, uh, the, the assistant principal of Stanford High School was also charged with failure to report. Uh, Stanfordhigh.org, I guess is the school's website. Donna Valentine, the 62-year-old school principal, and Roth Norton, the 59-year-old assistant principal, were charged with failure to report. We said an investigation revealed that the allegations of the sexual relation between the teacher and student were made known to the school's administration by several sources as early as December of last year. Absolutely, that's the function of these schools. They're there prior to the public law to abuse children. And the principal's function is to promote child abuse. And everybody who listens to us is well aware of this with my conversation with Scott K. Summers. In order to discharge congressional bankruptcy, a child has to be diagnosed with things. An adult has to be diagnosed with things. An elderly individual has to be diagnosed with things. And in order to do that, there are actors employed on the behalf of Congress by which to abuse children, traffic females, traffic males, traffic children, kill people. And again, we go back to Bureau and the actor who facilitates business. So they knew about it as early as December and uh, months before the alleged relationship came to an end. Daniel Watkins, 32, of Norwalk, had a su sexual relationship with a student from September until June, according to police. The 18-year-old victim told police that Ian Watkins had numerous sexual encounters during the time period. Uh, Watkins, Washington, police claim Principal Donna Valentine and Assistant Head Roth Norton were made aware of the liaison which lasted from September to June as early as December 2013, did not report it. Always. Man 27 charged statutory rape after police identify him by a tattoo of his ex-girlfriend's name on his genitals. Terrible. <laughs> An Oklahoma man was charged Thursday with two counts of second-degree rape after police identified him by a tattoo on his penis. Good. Good. Keep being stupid. Pediatric nurse, 50, sexually abused six-week-old foster baby. Oh, my God. I saw this one, and... Um, and shared photos and video of the abuse with counselor, right. 34 Michael Williams Lutz. Right. A and pediatric nurse. 
this is uh, what psychiatrists do. Uh, they are the ones that are taking and breaking children and then diagnosing the children by which to discharge congressional bankruptcy. And that child, being a foster child, was taken from its parents or the parents were killed, whatever is necessary, by the other agents of the Bureau, CPS. And this, this is stopping now. This is why they're being held accountable. It will no longer be tolerated. Yeah, thank God. And now they're putting this stuff out in the mainstream, you know, and this is only the current stuff going on. This, you know, this kind of reporting, if it had been going, well, it never would have went on this long if they'd reported it all along, right? No. Uh, people just wouldn't stand for it. But, so, Michael William Lutz, a pediatric nurse, accused of molesting the boy and sending pictures to the abuse counselor, Stephen Schaff, Schaffner, from Greensboro, Maryland. Another story, a woman I witnessed to drugs bust that earned Ferguson cop Darren Wilson Bravery Awards brands him angry, brutal, and violent. Absolutely. He'd gone down an 18-year-old recently. Is there any other evidence that's necessary? Cop who shot Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, was praised for extraordinary effort in the line of duty for the arrest of 28-year-old Christopher Brooks in February last year. Woman denies jeopardizing trial of killer cop Darren Wilson with compromising tweet leak that there is not enough evidence to charge him over the death of Michael Brown. Yeah. Now, what more do you need? Uh, the trial started just days after the August 9 shooting of Michael Brown by St. Louis officer Darren Wilson and will decide whether Wilson is to face any charges over the incident. Now, they keep showing old pictures of this Darren Wilson. I haven't seen any current new pictures. I mean, does this guy even exist? I don't know, but um, it, it was caught on... Picture and video, uh, witnesses were there that witnessed the murder of Michael Brown. And, um, you know, these, there's no getting out of it. The attorneys are trying to play their games. Well, they didn't have any police recording device going at the time, so there's no actual video of the... The actual killing. The actual, yeah, there when it went down video. right afterwards, I, right. I think there was a phone video right. of the aftermath. But the witnesses there on the ground had, you know, they gave their testimony and it was all in correlation. It didn't have any hiccups. And the only thing that has had hiccups and uh, fallacy to it is, of course, all of the reporting of Darren Wilson. He put out a picture that was not even himself, number one. Number two, there was conflicting stories that conflicted with the witness accounts. And, and you can go on well, down the, the police, list. Well, uh, the uh, police, you know, uh, write-up of the incident is always going to vary because they're instructed as to how to write these things up for the maximum uh, a charging effect, you know, by the attorney's policy Absolutely. handed down to them through the departments. Absolutely. And, and the district attorney is the one that's penciling them in there, and then they... Detectives and, and other agents are swearing, well, yeah, that's what I saw, too. Well, you you and I went through this most recently in February. And um, during this, quote, incident, I was recording, and, of course, 911 was recording. We got back the 911 tape, and it did not match my recording. And, you know, there was a big chunk of it missing in the favor of, of course, the district attorney. On top of that, the district attorney had penciled in witnesses that were not even there. And, uh, for example, one of them was one of our house, one of our house members, and um, who happened to be, what, you know, 1,000 miles away, 1,100 miles away at that time. And I was on the phone, on the other line, with that particular, quote, witness. And, you know, it, it was just insane to see the um, level of um, 
blasphemy that comes out of these district attorneys and their minions. Yeah, of course, they're operating in a private acts and acts of commerce, okay, which is adverse to the public law, and under the public law, uh, you know, only the truth is under the public law. Right. Anything other than the truth. Yeah, bearing false witness. Bearing false witness, all punishable that. Punishable by, you know, being thrown off the rock. And, um, you know, even in Rome, even in Rome, blasphemy and bearing false witness was punishable by being excommunicated or thrown off the uh, Tarpan Rock in Rome, which is the highest point in the city, of course, and, and metaphorically that meant, well, you, you're done. You lost the game, you're out of the city, you know, and, and of course that establishes the um, river Styx, or the metaphor of the river Styx, the um, lost vessel. And those vessels, of course, were declared dead by you last year, by court order. Had no choice. Right. We couldn't find them. Yeah. So, anyways, what this is, where this is going, St. Louis County woman Susan M. Nicholas claims her Twitter had been hacked at the time of the message. This message, uh, it's a, allegedly a compromising tweet leak, uh, which could force the grand jury trial to restart. Right, and it would have to because there's no, um, you know, attorney work product doctrine does not work anymore. So an attorney cannot any longer come in and say, oh, no, he didn't cross his T right there, and that letter isn't capitalized, so I guess I got to let this murderer walk free now. Darn the luck. They played that game forever. That game is no longer available. So if they have to purchase ringers, which is what this female sounds like, she's a ringer. Oh dear, I shared something that I should not have shared and now I've thrown the whole thing. It doesn't matter. You lost all that money you paid her. On top of that, we're going to take it to trial again. You're going to be held accountable. There's no such thing as a technicality anymore. Murder is murder. It doesn't matter if you were green when you committed the murder. It doesn't matter if your hair was shaved off when you committed the murder. It doesn't matter if you had shoes on when you committed the murder. It doesn't, none of those things matter. Murder is murder. Evidence is evidence. Done deal. Under the public law, there's none of that crap. It's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous what attorneys have done and and promoted for all of these years. These agents, they, they act like four-year-old children. They do not have minds of their own and they're screaming and screaming because they're trying to protect their attorney handlers when in, in reality they're all being cannibalized by those same attorney handlers. They don't want to see it. They're all in cognitive dissonance as well. Sure they are. Well, let's see here. Breckenridge. Breckenridge. It's like uh, from that old George Carlin joke about Congolia Breckenridge. Anyways, uh, there is a Breckenridge, Colorado. This comes from KDVR. A sheriff's deputy in Eagle County was arrested on a charge of sexual assault, officials said. Deputy T.J. Hay, who is a an 11-year veteran of the Eagle County Sheriff's Office was arrested Friday, said spokesman Jill Sarmo. Details about the assault have not been released, but Sarmo said the victim was an acquitted, an acquaintance of Hay, and that the assault happened when Hay was off duty around September 18th. Hay was arrested at his home in Gibson without incident, Sarmo said. His bond has been set at $15,000. Hay is next scheduled to appear in court on October 22nd. So that's a brand new one. Today, also today, uh, ex-Indiana Guard officer charged with bribery from the Indy Channel. Indiana National Guard's former recruitment commander faces federal charges that he solicited kickbacks from a company whose equipment prosecutors say he encouraged state guard units to buy. 
Okay, so that's uh, right. what yeah. inside uh, kind of a well, you know, it violates their own antitrust laws and stuff. You know, they follow their own laws. Of course, that's what they're charging them for now is under their own laws. Right, and then of course it's it's beneficial to somebody else now. And um, you know, it, it, whatever floats your boat, whatever floats your boat. The federal bribery charges filed in Virginia against retired Lieutenant Colonel Wesley Russell, 48, alleged that he sought the acceptance. He, he sought and accepted a 15% cut of profits from a company that sold recruiting equipment to state National Guard units. Russell encouraged Guard units from other states to buy the company's touchscreen boxes that played recruiting video and sold for about thirty thousand dollars each. Right, and, and this is in a, his own direction. Now, when you go into the research on what URSA Institute is, they're the programmers of law enforcement. They program and indoctrinate law enforcement uh, through a corporation known as Polaris. And anything that these, their um, representatives, let's say, whatever their representatives do and pitch, is it's much, much, much like the pharmaceutical industry itself. You know, pharmaceutical corporations pay their little, uh, what do they call them, uh, distributors or lobbyists or whatever. And it's the same thing with these law enforcement agents. They've been indoctrinated. They're useful idiots. They're selling a product on, on behalf of their handlers. Let's have some human rights here. Let's have some gay rights here. Let's have, you know, we need this for national security here. And, and that's all it is. But I don't want to see... The, the sheriffs be held as accountable as their attorney handlers. Again, you know, yes, they're they're playing the game, but they're they're not the monster. Yeah, the sheriff just he didn't roll on them quick enough. That's right, all. Right, right. And again, you go back to the story. <laughs> yeah, of, I mean, but not that he didn't do this stuff. Right. But, he just uh, got rolled on first because he's a little guy. And, and that's what it says in Matthew 27, when Judas hands back the silver, he, he goes to the chief priests and elders and he says, look, I know what you guys are doing, I don't want to have any other part of this anymore. And he handed back the silver and immediately he was politically cannibalized. He hung himself by political cannibalism. Indeed. Russell, who lives in the Delaware County town of Albany carried out the scheme from September 2012 until March 2013, the indictment said. And I notice that's an indictment, not an impeachment, by the way, again. Mm -hmm. Every time you hear that, I haven't seen that in the news for a while, but I, I imagine that'll start popping up here too as a story, uh, again, the old uh, impeachment trick. No, we'll see. They always play, you know, they play a mind game on you when they throw a these stories about possibly impeaching the president or whatever. I don't think the new owners allow that. Yeah, well, so maybe we won't see that again, but... See, these stories here we're covering, uh, these people are getting indicted, okay, and actually, you know, being held accountable. An impeachment is just, impeaches, you know, only, you impeach the evidence, you don't... <laughs> You don't impeach a president, right? Yeah. Uh, anyways, you can read impeach on Black's Law, I'll tell you. Maybe we'll get to that later. Uh, if I've not been officially charged yet in court, so I can't make comments at this time, he told Associated Press. Indiana National Guard officials didn't immediately comment about the case. Uh, Indiana Guard spokeswoman, Lieutenant Colonel Kathy Van Bree, said a statement was expected to be issued Friday. I didn't see it yet. Russell was among four retired and one active duty National Guard officials and a civilian from around the country charged with military bribery cases that were announced Wednesday, U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of Virginia. Russell carried out the kickback scheme with the owner of Ann Alexandria, Virginia based marketing and advertising company, according to the indictment. The names of the company owner and the business are included in the court documents. Russell is also charged with accepting money from the company owner for dinner and 
strip club expenses in the Washington right. area. And, and that is Quantico. That Quantico is located there in Alexandria. That's their little defense department that works for the FBI. And it, it goes along with this. But again, it wasn't the sheriff. It was his handlers. And uh, you'll, you'll notice that uh, the new chiefs of police, for example, are usually trained at Langley or um, Quantico. Or they're an attorney of some type. They're no longer law enforcement. They're no longer uh, going to, um, you know, school to be law enforcement. They're going to school to be a bureau, a cabal, a, a cartel. And that's what these attorneys are, quote, electing into the office of sheriff. And of course, as you know, there's no election, there's no voting. Um, it's all the electoral college. And it's nice to see that this is being presented in the news and um, but again we need to protect our sheriffs we don't need to uh, surround them with Congress's military any longer yeah you know there's a serious problem and I know this is too uh, with some stories I've been reading over the last year where the police chief the new police chiefs lots of new police chiefs this last couple of years right and you know, they'll tell about their history and graduated from law school, uh, got, got his, uh, um, you know, practice law. Yeah. His, you know, th there were attorneys. Yeah. What are they doing in law enforcement now? It's a. Uh, Insider trading. Beep, 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 beep. And, and, and again, they're trained to Quantico. They're FBI agents. And you don't want those in your communities. You, you want your sheriff, not a constitutional sheriff. You know, constitutional sheriff will uh, throw you down the river for uh, offsetting Congress's bankruptcy right. for you because the they love that constitution. Absolutely, and, and that constitution says I got that commerce clause, boy. I can, I, you know, I got these surety bonds here. The sheriffs, I mean, the good ones don't know. Yeah, and um, the horrifying ones are of course directed by the FBI and these attorneys and, the, and this is changing and that's what you're seeing the decrease in violence in your communities is because the FBI is being removed from your communities as well as their handlers and, and again uh, we're almost there everybody needs to have not patience um, faith, hope and charity because we're so close now from the Chicago Tribune, guard at Cook County Jail convicted of ordering inmates beating. Correctional officer at the Cook County Jail who ordered and then took part in the beating of a mentally ill inmate was convicted Thursday after another guard testified against her. Okay. Pamela Bruce shook her head and clenched her jaw as co-defendant Delphia Sawyer tearfully admitted on the stand that both of them had directed two inmates to attack the inmate inside his cell. This happens when you explit, ex, expletive, in other words, uh, when you mess with us here, to paraphrase, uh, that's what happens when you mess with us, Sawyer said, and she told other inmates on the psychiatric tier in the maximum security division 10 after the beating of Kyle Pilashefaski. Uh, Philoshask, 18. He's only 18. Sawyer had pleaded guilty Wednesday to one count of official misconduct in return for prosecutors recommended she be sentenced to probation. Bruce faces probation up to five years in prison after Judge James Lynn convicted her of multiple counts of official misconduct, perjury, battery, and obstruction of justice after a two-day bench trial. Good. This was just a terrible lapse in judgment, Lynn said. They lost their temper, and things got out of control. Sawyer and Bruce were working the 3 to 11 p.m. shift in February 2012 when inmates tried to light a makeshift cigarette made with orange peels and toilet paper, but instead cut out power to part of the tier. Two officers moved those uh, thought to be responsible into their cells, but... Pilashevsky was slow going back and called Sawyer a bitch, according to testimony. 
Sawyer testified that she then saw Bruce unlock Pilashevsk's cell after the officers saw him with a bed sheet around his neck. You want to hurt yourself? I got something for you, Sawyer quoted Bruce to, as saying. Two inmates then entered the cell and were repeatedly punched. Pilashevsky, uh, who was awaiting trial on an aggravated battery charge, Sawyer testified she joined in, kicking the teen in the side. She said she saw Bruce hit him with her police radio. Cover up the attack, the two wrote false reports, lied to supervisors and a grand jury, and instructed Bill Chase to, stay, to say he injured himself in a suicide attempt, prosecutor said. I did it because I was afraid. I knew it was wrong, and I was scared. What was she scared of? A crying Sawyer testified. Yeah, scared of what? If you're so scared, roll on your attorney handler. I wanted to cover up because I didn't want to be in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds, like a, it sounds like a five-year-old. Absolutely, but who directed it? Yeah, well, they're directors. Absolutely. This is not a momentary lapse in judgment. This was a cover-up from the beginning, Assistant State Attorney Ankur Shivasdeva uh, said in his closing arguments. He thought that she could get away with it because of who she was, and that's a disgrace for her, to her uniform. The story eventually unraveled. The physician at the jail hospital determined that Pilashevsky's injuries were not self-inflicted. A prosecutor testified that investigators interviewed all but one of the 47 men on their tier at the time of the attack, and about half said the two guards had directed the beating. In his closing argument Thursday, Bruce's attorney, Frank Edwards, urged the judge not to rely on the word of dangerous mental, mentally ill criminals, including a convicted murder and child sex offender, and he blasted Sawyer's reliability. She was doing it for her own self-interest, Edwards said. She's out here throwing her friend under the bus. After the trial, <laughs> they, they're, hey, they're using my language now. <laughs> After the trial, Edwards said that it broke Bruce's heart when her friend testified against the married mother, too. He said his client decided not to testify herself after learning prosecutors could charge her with additional perjury counts. I think they use those big names, too, just for you. They know how much you like different names and, and trying to pronounce them. <laughs> yes, okay. Well, I'm doing the best I can. Pilashevsky, and I apologize if that's not correct, but P-I-L-L-I-S-C-H-A-F-S-K-E, now 21, was jailed at the time of the beating on a charge he intentionally caused a car crash in a botched suicide attempt, injuring a woman in the other car. He pleaded guilty a few weeks later to aggravated battery and was sentenced to probation. Court records show he sued the officers, the county, and Sheriff Tom Dart in federal court in 2012. The case was settled for an undisclosed amount, court records show. Right, because they knew that they couldn't prove intent. And when somebody's suicidal, I don't advocate uh, su suicide, of course, and, and all of these things. But uh, he was not in his right mind uh, to be in a suicidal state to begin with. So there's no way that he could have had intent to harm um, unless he, you know, intentionally... The other driver, you mean, right. they hurt. Yeah, well, right. But, yeah, that's the thing, though. He's, you're violating the public law when you're... And you harm somebody else. That's, Absolutely. I mean, I know it wasn't his intent, but by his, him not being attentive to what could happen because of repercussions of what he is done or attempting to do, you know, then, you know, that's the lapse of judgment in the public law, and you got to be held accountable for that. Right. And, and part of that is, you know... Um, but it wasn't up to these jailers to just beat him up because no. they were mad at him. Right, right. And, of course, that, that, it requires a parent at that point because he is acting out of it as an infant. Um, he's not in his right mind, and, and that's when parents betray kicks in, not when there's suspicion or uh, 
testimony given two or more times to maintain the same statement. However, uh, there's evidence. He has evidence himself to be need, in need of being parented. And that that is what is occurring. Um, he's not to be, you know, tortured during his time in jail or wherever he needs to be um, to keep him safe from harming himself and others. Yeah, I agree. Well, let's see here. Um, how about a little money beat here from blogs.wsj. Dot com. Bill Gross kicks off new Janus job with only one trader. Or yeah, that, that's Janus, J A N U S. Yeah, it's Janus. And watching this, he just left Pimco and he left him high and dry. And I'm like, holy moly, this is like the, the riskiest venture ever. I've never seen such risk. And, and, riskiest um, venture ever, huh? Riskiest. And I'm like, oh my gosh, it is so, I don't know. I, I've been watching him, like, I've been glued to this, watching him. Maybe I'm, this will pop see. up on the mainstream. This is kind of like a little um, well, off-to-the-side blog that we found this on. Well, this one's Wall Street Journal. It's just part of the blog. System. Oh, I see. Oh, yeah, WSJ, right, yeah. Wall Street Journal. And, um, Duh, sorry. Man, I'm just glued to this guy because I want to see what he's going to do and, and um, I'm rooting for him he's, I've never seen such risk yeah, let's see here uh, it's not terribly long I could read it uh, Bill Gross earned the Bond King moniker by surrounding himself with the strong stable of talent at PIMCO now he reportedly will have just one loyal subject According to the Morning Star, Mr. Gross has requested only one trader by his side at his new gig at Janus Capital Group, Inc. Mr. Gross shocked Wall Street last month by departing PIMCO, the firm he co-founded in 1971 amid clashes between top management and billions of outflows at PIMCO, total return, the flagship fund he managed. Mr. Gross would have been fired from PIMCO had he not resigned the journal reported he joined Janus or Janus this week a firm only a tenth as big as PIMCO in assets under management to support gross end of the business Janus will need to have the infrastructure in place to manage a sudden influx of cash Summit Desai and an analyst at Morningstar wrote in a research note so far, Gross has requested just one trader to assist him in the Newport Beach, California office that Janice will set up for him, as well as potentially one client-facing person. Mr. Desai expects that level of support won't be sufficient as cash follows Mr. Gross to Janice. That's what I'm thinking. I mean, I'm watching this guy and I'm like, holy cow. I, I just, I, I'm really interested in this one. And it stands in, con, uh, in stark contrast to PIMCO, where Gross was able to get more and better information than any other bond investor, thanks to the firm's army of traders, research analysis, portfolio managers, and other specialists, none of whom has joined Gross in leaving PIMCO, he said. It's unlikely that Janus will ever match that level of support, raising the question of how successful Gross can be with fewer resources. Representative from Janus wasn't immediately available for comment. Mr. Gross received a mile-high welcome at Janus this week. In a tweet published Wednesday morning, Denver-based Janus publicized an official welcome to Mr. Gross, which included a picture of him flanked by Janus CEO Dick Wheel and President Bruce Kopgan Monday as Mr. Gross's first day at Janus. Starting October 6th, he will manage the Janus Global unconstrained bond fund which is just 13 million dollars in assets the idea of Bill Gross rolling up his sleeve and single-handedly managing money at a startup fund is an intriguing one Mr. Desai said but the reality is that he has long relied on a talented team and vast pool of resources at PIMCO that Janice can't possibly match anytime soon the reality is also that Gross will have broader responsibilities related to building out Janus fixed income business that we don't have much indication on the length of his commitment.
he added. Investors considering Janus should keep these issues in mind. Right, and, and I thought that was so interesting, the, the way that that was written, because when somebody does something very, very good, and they're very precise, and they're very efficient at it, usually that says they love the thing that they're doing, and in such, they are like we are. When it comes to making oneself more efficient, we adhere to Occam's razor, and we simplify and his new approach is the simplest form. He cut out the overhead. And I want to see, you know, like I said, I'm just glued to this one. Because he seems like he really loves what he's doing. All right. Well, we'll keep that one in our sides here. Let's see. Next on my list, I got here X Deplane's cop gets six months in prison for faking DUI arrest tally. ChicagoTribune.com. Former DePlane's police commander who padded DUI arrest records so the department could get federal grant money was sentenced today to six months in prison. And this one was beautiful to me. And, um, you know, he was padding the arrest records, which means that he's not arresting human beings. He is writing that he is down. So in actuality, he was adhering and enforcing the public law and and i i don't want to see anybody charged for these things if they're enforcing the public law right of course united states incorporated did uh timothy Vite, 57 apologized in chicago's dirksen u.s courthouse for his role in defrauding the national highway traffic safety administration and the illinois department of transportation out of nearly 133,000 in public safety grant funding Right, but they're a bankrupt entity. How are they charging him now? Right. I'm very sorry for the damage and reputation to the police department, my family, and myself, he said in a courtroom crowded with relatives and members of his former department. I had no intention to cause harm to anybody. Oh, psych psychiatry has got him feeling bad about himself. Right. Poor guy. In addition to the six-month prison term, Judge Samuel der Jägerheyen sentenced Veet to 200 hours of community service. His plea agreement with prosecutors also requires him to repay IDOT, that's Indiana Department of Transportation, about $34,500 in restitution. This reminds me of a Shakespearean tragedy where a good man went bad, uh, the judge uh, Durahigan said. Veet's attorney, Anthony Mascaipinto, said his client had been made a scapegoat for the department. It had felt pressured to meet quotas to secure funding, as attorney said. Absolutely. To say Tim Veet is, is single-handedly to blame is ridiculous. Uh, the attorney, Michael, you know, here's another one, M-A-S-C-I-O-P-I-N-T-O. <laughs> Massachusetts. I think they just put all those letters together just for you, and those aren't real names anymore. <laughs> I I don't know. I don't know too many Massachusetts. <laughs> Anyways, uh, it was well known. Nothing he did was a secret. V, a Mount Prosecutor resident, uh, or, or Mount Prospect resident, was ordered to report to prison by December 16th. He pleaded guilty to a misdemeanor charge of misappropriation of government funds. He could have been sentenced up to a year in prison. From 2009 to 2012, he padded the department's total number of DUI arrests by 122 to conceal its failure to meet the requirements of an NHTSA-funded impaired driving enforcement campaign administered by IDOT, according to prosecutors. And, and the prosecutors are admitting in evidence right here and in the court record that they have quotas yeah we, we've known this right they, they, they put them in the guys uh you know under policy they can sneak them in under policy wait but right here because they're charging him for not meeting quota they're evidencing that they set a quota how are they charging for that when it's just a business schematic? And their business declared bankruptcy in 1933. Right. 
I know. This is what they do. <laughs> it's insane. It's just, it's a, I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's no wonder they're still holding Rocco without anything, and and uh, well, they're getting insane. themselves into a big pickle up there, though, in Kenosha, aren't they? Well, I'm just thankful to the media for presenting this to the sheeple, so that sheeple can actually see what's going on. This is insane. Yeah, yeah. Shout out to the mainstream media for some of these, huh? Um, but let's see. As part of the scheme, he provided phony blood alcohol content levels for those fictitious arrests. Right. That enabled the department to collect almost 133,000 in federal money over those years. Thirty said. Right, but he was protecting humanity. He didn't arrest them. Right. So he was enforcing the public law, and he should never be punished for enforcing the public law, ever. Yeah, and, you know, what I suspect, they go out and they print it here too, we don't think he did this to line his own pockets, said Assistant U.S. Attorney Megan Church. Right, it, it lined hers, because she's the U.S. Attorney... <laughs> Under the Judiciary Act. Come on, she's but, Attorney General. The Attorney Generals are cashing in. The judges are cashing in. Everybody's getting a piece of this, except for law enforcement. Right. But, okay, she goes on to say, but what is abundantly clear is no one asked him to lie. He is still, it? He still did not harm a human being. He was protecting human beings. Right. So... It's like uh, the, the the robotic laws, Asmanov, because that's that's exactly what this is. He he facilitated an action that actually protected human beings, and I don't care if it embezzles money from a corporation. I don't care if it uh, runs over the foot of a psychopath. I don't care if it beheads a psychopath. If you are protecting a human being, you're protecting a human being. Period, and you are to be rewarded for those things. Not punished, but but this is a, a, another example to all of the agents of, of political cannibalism. He rolled on his handlers or attempted to. They got to him first. Well, well, well look, look what this guy does here. Um, when V received an email from an IDOT grant administrator in March of 2012 that the department might be audited. He told his commanding officer he had fudged the numbers, prosecutor yeah. said. So, I mean, he fessed up to it right away. Right. Matthew Viet, 27. Viet retired from the department three months later after 31 years on the force. Now he's going to lose his off. pension now? Yeah. After a federal investigation, the city was barred from participating in the NHTSA and IDOT grants until September 2015. It also agreed to pay 92000 in restitution and penalties. In all, 13 to plain... Police officers, some of whom prosecutors said attended Thursday's court hearing in an apparent show of support for V, got suspensions ranging from seven to sixty days for accepting overtime payments so they're from the grant them. programs for hours they didn't work. They're punishing them for upholding the public law. You, the, the, those entities, all of them, need to be arrested under the public law. Tell law enforcement, pick up those those policy enforcement officers there and policy uh, promoters. Pick up their attorneys. Law enforcement is never, ever, ever, ever to be held accountable for anything other than harm against a human being. And if they are preventing harm from occurring upon humanity, then they are to be rewarded accordingly. Period. Plains Police Officer William Kushner, who was hired after the fraud came to light, said the officers were not fired because they made up one-third of the city's police force. Since the fraud was discovered, officers have had to work to earn the trust of the residents again, he said. Citizens come up to me and say, when I get stopped by police officers, I ask, are you one of the 13, said Kushner, who attended the sentencing. Not only has he stained his own reputation, he's stained the reputation of anyone who wears a badge in northern Illinois. But he didn't do anything wrong. I, how he, can you... He's outside of the good old boys club. You can't, I mean, how can you get any more stained reputation? You work, uh, uh, you've been, you know, working as privateers, um, shaking down uh, human beings um, to offset congressional bankruptcy. 
Well, there's, right? there's 13 right there that are good guys. That we're yeah. not shaking down human beings. And, exactly. And and they are to be. And those protected. are 13 that I the United States Incorporated is, is demonizing. And, and those are the 13 that I want working that for That shows the you the division States. more and more in the sand there between the private... X and X commerce, you know, them versus the public law. Absolutely. And, and our law enforcement, you know, you know, you, you already have the directives based on the evidence. Uh, all 13 of them are to be protected by the United States and rewarded accordingly. Well, let's see here. In Mexico, this is the big story at AP and... Um, Mexico City, three soldiers charged in Mexico Army killing of 22. Yeah, I saw that one. This reminds me of uh, an episode of um, Sons of Anarchy or something. Absolutely, exactly. Exactly. Let's see. Uh, months after the Mexican Army said it had killed 22 suspected gang members in a fierce shootout, three soldiers are being charged with homicide. This announcement late Tuesday was another step in dismantling the official version of the June 30 confrontation, which came under question almost immediately because of the lopsided outcome. Only one soldier was injured, but Attorney General Jesus uh, Murillo Karam's version of events raised more questions about the killings in an abandoned warehouse in southern Mexico. A witness said most of the deaths happened after the suspects had surrendered, following an initial firefight in which one person died. The UN urged they be investigated as uh, possibly summary executions. And they were, the way that they were carried out was execution style. Why would the UN be uh, urging they do that? Well, they're behind the... Good, good, the good cops? Right, well, the UN <laughs> is trying to save face here as well. Yeah. Um, Ban Ki-moon is, like, hemorrhaging and, and everything, because, remember, he was the Secretary General uh, of the hospitality game, so they're trying to put in a good appearance now. But, uh, right, that's kind of what I yeah. suspect, too. Mm -hmm. well, after a brief initial firefight with eight soldiers, three of them entered a warehouse where the suspects had taken refuge and opened fire with no justification whatsoever, Karam said in a news conference. He offered no details on whether the suspects had already surrendered, whether they were unarmed, or how three soldiers could kill 21 people without anyone trying to flee a wide open hangar like building. Doesn't it seem strange that eight soldiers face off against 22 suspects and all the deaths are on one side of those with numeric superiority? Said uh, uh, Alondro Hope, a Mexico City based security analyst, or analyst, rather. What was this? A squad of Rambos? Or had the suspects already been disarmed? Whichever way, this doesn't smell good. The military initially said that no, that a prolonged confrontation occurred when a patrol unit came under fire in the town of San Pedro Limon, an area in Mexico State known to be dominated by drug cartels. The witness, who asked that her name not be used for fear of reprisals, told the Associated Press that the Army first, uh, they fired first said she said that the 21 had given up and walked out of the warehouse and that soldiers led them back inside and killed them her daughter 15 year old Erika gomez gonzalez who had been wounded in the leg in the initial shootout was turned over and shot several times in the torso the witness said she said tuesday that all eight of the soldiers at the scene were involved in the shooting not just three though she couldn't remember exactly how many were present. Though uh, the indictment occurred three months ago, she said she still hasn't been interviewed by federal investigators and by Mexico's human rights investigators right, just within was, the last two weeks. Right, the FBI carried it out, always. It's always the FBI carrying it out. They're the facilitators of business, and of course, they don't need to interview her. They already know what happened. They executed a whole bunch of people. Yeah, I mean, that's what, the more I read on this, uh, 
The Attorney General's office would not say if it had interviewed the witness, and the Human Rights Commission couldn't be immediately reached for comment. They don't need to because the Attorney General called it out. An AP review of the warehouse days after the shooting showed a few stray shots and no sprays of gunfire within the large grain warehouse where the alleged gang was hiding. Instead, bullet holes and blood stains indicated some were shot against or against the walls at close range. Right, it was a firing squad. It was execution style. Photographs from the scene leaked to a local news agency showed most of them, most of the bodies against the wall with guns lying near or propped against them to appear as if they went down shooting. Right. Last week, the Army detained one officer and several soldiers for disobedience and uh, dereliction of duty in retaliation or re in relation to the incident. Those charges are separate from the Attorney General's civil probe. Right. Marilo Karam said Tuesday a squad of seven soldiers and a lieutenant were involved in the killings while a battalion was about 550 soldiers. Normally platoons of about 30 led by a lieutenant are sent to fight drug traffickers according to a person close to the military who was not authorized to speak to the press. Yeah, yeah, they were trying to play some PR there. It's a bunch of bull, bull, hor bull hockey? Yeah, bull hockey. Um, I believe it's um, termed poppycock in reference to that uh, South part. Mm -hmm. That uh, was a good one. Real Quaram said five members of the eight-man squad appeared to have stayed outside while the killings occurred, he said. There were doubts about one enlisted man's account that could lead to a fourth set of charges. They would be formally arraigned on Wednesday. From the start, he had detected some inconsistencies, he said, but he did not explain why it took federal investigators two and a half months to file charges. His office would not say when it took the case from the state prosecutors who normally have jurisdiction in homicides. AP reporters revisited the warehouse two weeks ago and there were no signs of a federal investigation. But photographs of the national newspaper Molino on Tuesday showed the warehouse roped off with the Attorney General's office caution tape and markings of the bullet holes indicating that investigators only arrived within the last two weeks. Nor did Murillo Karam explain why his findings contradicted those of Mexico state prosecutors who said in a July 15 statement that their investigations had found an equal exchange of fire and no evidence at all of any possible execution. The autopsy reports on the victims have been classified as state secrets for nine years. Yeah. Of course it has. Rights groups have said that have said the killings may prove to be one of the most serious massacres in Mexico in recent memory. Because it's always the attorneys cashing in. It's the attorneys who directed this, the FBI who carried it out, and now here's some more attorneys and they're coming in and saying, Oh, you poor babies. Pay me money and I will sue them for you. The civilian justice system has been totally discredited and looks very bad, said Raul Benitez, a security expert at Mexico's National Autonomous University. It looks as if they don't perform objective investigations, but rather do them for political purposes and to cover up crimes. Absolutely. Hallelujah. End of story. So, yeah, <laughs> that story there... I mean, it had it all, even about down to the drug cartels. Right. Okay. Which we're not even talking about. And why, you know, was one drug cartel at odds with another drug cartel? Is that what we see going on here, maybe? Absolutely. And I mean, by the same. evidence, we've seen... Uh, yep. It's the same FBI. And, and this, this seems in some sense of anarchy. I mean, I can't even hardly keep up because it's all the same characters and they're all doing the same thing but they all have different faces and different masks and boy it's just heating up out there yeah it's getting kind of dicey people are uh you know getting squeezed or trying to put the squeeze on 
everybody here, all the corporations, says... Uh, they asked for it. They begged for it. They begged for it. So anyways, I mean, I just see that as the one drug cartel was executing uh, some members from another cartel because they're muscling on their business. Absolutely, and it's always the same. Always, always, always the same. And it's always the same FBI establishing itself as a criminal element and then pointing the fingers at other <coughs> faces of itself as a criminal element. And, of course, it's handlers. The attorney general comes in and says, Oh, let me protect you, honey. It's it's ISIS. It's not the FBI. It's Hamas. It's not the FBI. It's that drug cartel over there. It's not the FBI. It's those extremists over there. It's not the FBI. Oh, dear. Let me charge them for you on your behalf. If only you'd patronize me and call me your Lord God. It's the same Moses as it always has been. Well, just to give you an idea of how bad it's getting out there for some, Marriott Hotel, fine for blocking Wi-Fi at Nashville Hotel. Wow. This is, uh, let's see, CNBC uh, routers, actually. Um... Just today, Marriott International Inc. will pay a fine of $600,000 to resolve a Federal Communications Commission probe into the blocking of guest Wi-Fi networks at its Gaylord Opryland Hotel in Nashville, Tennessee. There's the Gaylord again. We just had the Gaylord on the show last night, didn't we? Yes. Uh, they have a sense of humor. The Gaylord Opryland Hotel. Yeah, the investigation revealed that Marriott employees had disabled Wi-Fi networks established by consumers in the conference facilities, while at the same time charging consumers, small businesses, and exhibitors as much as $1,000 per device to access Marriott's Wi-Fi network, the FCC said in a statement. Wow, they were acting as their own regulatory commission. That's terrible. Thousand dollars, like their hotel, um, yeah, you know, in keeping. The, the, you know, rental of those rooms isn't enough. I'm sure. Uh, the the interference and disabling of Wi-Fi networks was a violation of Section 333 of the Communications Act. The FCC said. Pro began after the FCC received a complaint from an individual in March 2013 alleging that the Gaylord Opryland was jamming mobile hotspots in the hotel. So they're just jamming everybody's hotspots, uh, so you got to go pay for their Absolutely. service. It's in insider trading as well. <laughs> it's funny. Consumers who purchase the cellular data plans should be able to use them without fear that their personal internet connection will be blocked by their hotel or conference center, Travis LeBlanc Enforcement Bureau Chief said in the statement. Uh, there's that word bureau, bureau again, huh? Yeah. The FCC ruling said Marriott has to stop the unlawful use of Wi-Fi blocking technology and file compliance and usage reports with the Bureau every three months for three years. Now, that's like an act of war when you block communications. Absolutely, and it, and it is um, you know, under APUSA, but these are interesting days. Very interesting days. I love the new market conditions. Marriott said it believed that the Gaylord Opryland's actions were unlawful and expected the SEC to make rules to end the confusion over this issue. Absolutely. Uh, well, well, let's see. Uh, quit the warfare against human beings uh, under the public law. You don't need to write anything down. Just uh, adhere to the public law. Marriott has a strong interest in ensuring that when our guests use our Wi-Fi service, they will be protected from rogue wireless hotspots that can <laughs> cause degrading service, insidious cyber attacks, and identity theft, the company said. <laughs> they were protecting you from having slow internet. That, that's sad. That is so sad. <laughs> <laughs> yes. What a defense. Now, ironically here it says Marriott shares closed up 2% at 
dollars and ten cents on the Nasdaq on Friday. Absolutely, that's the cool market condition. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, let's see. Trump loses bid to end pension payments at cas casino. He's having a bad day. CNBC.com. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff happening, and his hair looks worse than normal, too. Trump Taj Mahal failed on Friday to get approval from a U.S. bankruptcy judge to end payments to the casino's union pension fund, which had been a key condition for a Carl... Icon back deal to rescue the gambling complex in Atlantic City, New Jersey. U.S. Bankruptcy Judge Kevin Gross in Wilmington, Delaware, said he lacked authority to allow Trump Entertainment Resorts, the bankrupt owner of Taj Mahal, to reject a portion of his collective bargaining agreement, or CBA. Um, and then you can read more about uh, why a judge... Judge's stock and bankruptcy ruling matters. Gross said he would consider a request by the company to reject the entire CBA, including the need to make pension payments at an October 14th hearing. Oh, we'll, we'll update as information comes available. Disney Ferris wheel breaks down, stranding riders. This is just today. Scary stuff. I don't know who would want to visit Disney. This last year alone, they've been picking up a lot of pedophiles. And, oh, yeah, terrible. yeah. Right. We had that uh, pedophilia, child uh, sex abuse scandal with all those Disney employees. Mm -hmm. uh, I covered that. You can look in the archives of Mono's Entertainment on YouTube. Uh, this is NBC Los Angeles. Stranding Riders. California Adventures. Uh, Adventure Ferris Wheel Riders were stranded for about 90 minutes in a height heat on Thursday after a ride broke down. A statement from Disneyland said that Mickey's Fun Wheel was experiencing technical difficulties and that riders were removed from the 150 foot high wheel. Colossus roller coaster ending with marathon rides around 30 riders were evacuated with the last exiting around 6 p.m. Orange County Register reported. No injuries were reported. The safety of our guests and cast members is our highest priority, Disneyland said in a statement. It's the second such problem in recent months at the theme park. Well, then that um, that cartoon recently, what was that that Mickey Mouse was in? Oh, it was terrifying. Oh, last season from South Park, oh. you know, they had uh, portrayed uh, Mickey Mouse. <laughs> oh, that was so creepy. Absolutely creepy, but dead on. I mean, it's always been like that. They promoted so much propaganda oh, yeah. originally, and then they kind of... Yeah, Mickey Mouse was a, he was a, uh, just a gangster. Absolutely. He was better than uh, and that boy band wanted to quit or something to go on his own, as I recall, or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so Mickey says, yeah, yeah, sure you can. Come here. And as he proceeds to beat the crap out of him. Absolutely. It, 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 it's the same old Mickey Mouse that they used to, used to uh, promote war propaganda. <laughs> you know, it's just, it, it was quite interesting. Bucks County doctor admits to child porn charges. It's, NBC Philadelphia. Pennsylvania's really taken a lot of a beating here because... Uh, oh, I got on this site, yeah. Um, these are just off my notes right now, but I should get back on the site because one just led to another, and they were, like, all over the place here. Uh, so, what they, the Charter of Liberties? You know, Penn's Charter was just a repeat of the Coronation Charter, the original uh, Charter of Liberties. And, um, oh man, it's just, uh, it's so beautiful to see, uh, but again, this pounding that Pennsylvania is under is, is just, wow. These days are very interesting indeed. So a suburban Philadelphia doctor admitted in court that he 
downloaded videos and images depicting children engaging in sexual acts. Dr. Quentin Andrew Parker, 37, of Levittown, pleaded guilty Wednesday child pornography and other related offenses. Hey, I like these names in uh, Philadelphia. I can read these. <laughs> Bucks County doctor faces child porn charges. Um, let's see. Parker told authorities he downloaded and viewed material showing girls ranging in age from 9 to 13 years old performing oh. sexual acts on his computer. Police say they were led to Parker by tracking 58 files that were downloaded to a computer located in his home between April 19th and June 3rd. Investigators later discovered even more images and videos on a computer inside his home. Parker posted 10% of a hundred and fifty thousand dollar bail or remains free. Man, I, I, I hate they're still doing that. They gotta quit they gotta quit releasing all these uh, dangerous dangerous entities. Uh, officials say his sentences was deferred until he undergoes a sex offender evaluation. Teachers aid. Well, what's their evaluate? I, I, he's got these stuff on his. Yeah. Anyways, teachers aid arrested for DUI outside school. Police. Uh, that's another story, I guess. Uh, yeah. Like I said, I yeah, I just copied these off there, and it's all lead to all these other stories. But I guess uh, it's another one. A teachers aid arrested for DUI. Anyways, back to this. Parker worked in the area or ARIA, Health Administration Physician Training Program, though he was not an official member of their medical staff, he was placed on administrative leave after his arrest. Pennsylvania priest to remain behind bars as he awaits sex tourism trial. A federal magistrate has ordered a Roman Catholic priest from Pennsylvania to remain jailed until his trial on sex tourism charges. The Reverend Joseph Mariso Jr. was arrested last week on allegations that he traveled to the Honduras to have sex with children while he did missionary work with the poor. He was placed on leave from the Altoona Johnston Diocese earlier this month. At a hearing Monday in Johnston, prosecutors called Mariso a danger to his community and a flight risk. Absolutely. But a relative and two family friends cited his religious work and said they have seen him around children and had no concerns about his conduct. Of course, they probably prey on children too. U.S. Magistrate Judge Keith Pesto said they had painted what he called a Father Jekyll and Mr. Hyde portrait that made his decision especially difficult. Let's see. Pennsylvania Museum had arrested on child sex and pornography charges. Sick, sick, sick. Chief Executive Officer and Historic Central Pennsylvania Mansion and Museum has been jailed on federal child sex and pornography charges. Christopher G. Lee, 65, of Bullsburg, pleaded not guilty after his arrest Thursday and remained jailed after appearing before a federal magistrate. Lee heads the Bold Mansion Museum in Bullsburg, about 140 miles east of Pittsburgh. The homestead features furnishings and artifacts from the Bold family, which founded the town where the museum is located, and the Farmers High School, which eventually became Penn State University. U.S. Attorney Peter Smith said the illegal acts with minors occurred between January and June on the museum premises where students from across the United States and other countries volunteer to work as guides. Three-page uh, three indictment contains few details, but contends Lee tried to coerce the 17-year-old to travel across state lines in phone and computer communi communications and did transport an unnamed child across state lines for illegal sexual activity. He also is charged with receiving unspecified child pornography, including images of child of children younger than 12. Probably got it from that archbishop that just got nailed with 100,000 files on his computer, huh? Absolutely. He was probably like the librarian for the uh, Catholic Church pedophile ring. Absolutely. That uh, the recent pedophile that you're referring to 
is of course the one that's being kept in the Pope's cabana uh, back of his property under the Vatican prison system, which of course is uh, vacation. Yeah, so this guy here in Pennsylvania is going to have no such luck, though, thank goodness, I guess. Thank goodness. Uh, let's see. Lee is also charged with receiving unspecified child pornography, including images of children younger than 12. Center County District Attorney Stacy Parks Miller said at a news conference Thursday that her office still is working with state college police, the FBI, and the state attorney general's office as part of an ongoing investigation. The alleged 17-year-old victim first contacted state college police about Lee's alleged contact, and, uh, which occurred the first night the teen stayed at the Bull Mansion. They waste no time, do they? Uh, Lee faces 10 years to life in prison if convicted of the interstate transportation charge and five years to life on the child pornography charge. Okay. Uh, yeah, he won't. He won't get the. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean the, that sixty-six-year-old archbishop that you were just talking about. He, you know, this is what he needs. He needs to be absolutely called out of the Vatican and yeah. and held, you know, held accountable under the public law. Right, but the Pope doesn't want to be held accountable, so of course he's going to uh, offer to save. Many until until our law enforcement catches up with the Pope, of course. That uh, blasphemous rat bastard. Yeah. Uh, Pope Francis now. Uh, Benny the, the Rat was the first uh, Pope to ever uh, quote unquote retire. It never happened before until this, you know, Pope Benny the Rat. It's just sick. Sick, 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 dirty birds. So, anyways, let's see. There's more about this uh, at uh, the Philly.com or uh, no, that was uh, NBC Philadelphia.com. You know, and the link from that story goes to a doctor admits to child porn charges and. Uh, let's see here. I guess I can read the rest of this. Um, I think there's some stuff. Uh, his attorney, Joseph Amendola, didn't immediately return a call for comment. Oh, okay, no, no surprise there. Amendola was the defense attorney when former Penn State assistant football coach Jerry Sandusky was convicted of molesting several boys and sent to prison for decades in a scandal that rocked the university. That's so she specifies, I mean, she yeah. um, specializes in... <laughs> Protecting uh, pedophiles. No, and losing. And, and that's not a very good advertisement for that attorney. Um, Sandusky was convicted, and so, uh, I don't know. Well, right, okay. She's, she's well, then maybe we like, like her. I don't, she, I don't. she doesn't sound like a pinch hitter anyway. I don't really like attorneys, but they, if they work for us, then at least you got to like that part about them. Right? <laughs> If they're rolling on somebody, I love that. Uh, lo lo love that. You gotta love that, right? It's just that you got what attorney? I mean, who would want Jerry Sandusky's <laughs> attorney? <laughs> well, maybe we need to get this Amendola then for that Archbishop. Absolutely, and Rick Perry and all of them. Just throw her in there. She sounds like a good attorney. <laughs> yeah, and so yeah, Sandusky was convicted of molesting several boys and sent to prison for decades in the scandal. But did he go to a federal penitentiary? Mm. Did he get federal prison? Yeah, you know, I don't remember where they sent him. Yeah. Well, they're different now. Um, you know, because uh, we we cut back on the funding for stuff like that, so it, it's actually all prisons under the United States are all the same now. They they don't have the golf course appearance and, and things like that and, and um, it, it's really nice to um, these days are interesting um, court records indicate Amendola also was Lee's attorney when he was charged in 2005 with 
indecent assault, and other crimes for allegedly fondling two boys, ages 10 and 8, who were staying overnight at the Bolt Mansion. Lee eventually was given nine months probation in a first offender's program that didn't require him to plead guilty and later had his arrest records partially expunged. Yeah, well, now it's different. Yeah, that was under attorney work product doctrine Absolutely. then. Museum officials didn't immediately return calls for comment. Lee also is a supervisor in Harris Township where officials told the Center Daily Times they're monitoring the legal situation but otherwise not commenting. Lee ran as a Democrat against state Representative Kerry Benninghoff two years ago, incumbent Republican defeated Lee in the 17th District State House race. Federal court records indicate a judge was scheduled, uh, has scheduled jury selection for a trial to begin December 1st in federal court in Williamsport. Good. We'll have to uh, update on this one as information becomes available. Had a couple attorneys. Uh, pop up on the radar today. Cottage Grove's fire or Cottage Grove fires attorney. This is from the RegisterGuard.com, and um, let's see the city of city of Cottage Grove. Uh, the city has terminated its contract with city attorney Sean Kelly after his arrest last week on a charge of driving under the influence of intoxicants. Good. Kelly, 44, was arrested by Springfield Police while operating a motorcycle on Pioneer Parkway West near B Street, according to Police Sergeant Rich Carbonell. Kelly was contracted by the city through his firm, which is paid between $60,000 and $80,000 annually for legal services. Kelly also served as municipal prosecutor. Cottage Grove City Manager Richard Myers said he was made aware of Kelly's arrest on Tuesday and gathered information on Wednesday before deciding Thursday to terminate Kelly's contract. Myers said the city will rely on an interim city attorney and interim prosecuting attorney and will advertise soon to fill those positions. This was not the first time this year that Kelly has been in legal hot water on January 2nd. Kelly was arrested by Oregon State Police on a charge of fourth degree assault in connection with a domestic dispute. Holy cow. At the time, Myers said he was deciding whether to renew Kelly's contract. The charges, but he went ahead and renewed him, didn't he? <laughs> I mean, come on. The charges against Kelly eventually were dropped. The Lane County prosecutors citing insufficient evidence and Kelly's contract was continued. Calls to Kelly's office for comment on Thursday were not immediately returned. Kelly was driving 50 miles an hour in a 35 mile per hour zone when he was pulled over by an officer on September 26th, Carbonell said. The officer smelled alcohol and Kelly was given a field sobriety test. Carbonell said he was taken in custody just after 10.30 p.m. and booked into the Springfield Municipal Jail. He posted bail a short time later and was released. Wow. Yeah, they released him, so look out. Be on the lookout for an attorney on the loose. He's dangerous. Okay, here's another one. Bergen County lawyer arrested, charged with theft by deception. This is the patch.com, New Jersey. A Harrington Park man was arrested for theft by deception. Notice that man and attorney are interchangeable there, I guess, huh? Absolutely. Former Oradell attorney Luis A. Cabazzi, 49, allegedly took legal fees from numerous clients without performing legal services, including bankruptcy, loan modifications, immigration work, and family matters, according to a Bergen County prosecutor, John L. Molinelli. Gasp. Don't they always do that? Yeah, this is what they <laughs> normally do. Give me your money so I won't do anything except for write up this, uh, you know, at the last minute, I'll write up uh, a motion, which would be, uh, which is going to be worse for you than having no attorney whatsoever. Because <laughs> the motion, uh, you know, the motions they write up are, I, I mean, 
they they usually open up a lot more uh, charges for the you know the court to look at. Every word is worth gold. I mean, that's how they've been making their living forever, and, and it's so profound to see these attorneys now being charged with barratry and ambulance chasing, and you know, being attorneys basically. Posse is currently listed as a temporary disability inactive by order of the New Jersey State Supreme Court since June 25th. Ooh, maybe they gave him a psych about The New Jersey office, well, they had to have. Absolutely, if they found him disabled. The New Jersey Office of Attorney Ethics received over 40 complaints from his former clients alleging that they paid him legal fees and retainers but did not receive the legal services for which they paid. Losses are alleged to be approximately one point million dollars gasp. Wow. Police executed a search warrant on Capazzi's home on October second and charged him with one count each of theft by deception. Bail was set at seven hundred thousand dollars with no ten percent option. Wow. The surrender of his passport and an ankle bracelet program as conditions of bail. Capazzi was Remanded to the Bergen County Jail in lieu of bail. Aww, he was remitted, remanded. That's so cute. It's another surety being born. Well, well, well. Yeah, more from the Philly.com. Cop arrested over domestic assault. Kenneth Allen, a Philly cop who allegedly assaulted his girlfriend while both were on duty was taken into custody by internal affairs investigators yesterday. Holy cow. Tasha Jamerson, a spokeswoman for the district attorney's office, said Allen had been arrested. He has been charged with aggravated assault, simple assault, possession of an instrument of crime, recklessly endangering another person, and criminal mischief. Police Commissioner Charles Ramsey said Allen, who joined the force in 2011, will be suspended for 30 days with the intent to dismiss. Ramsey said Allen will be hit with a long list of offenses. The commissioner told the Daily News earlier this week that Allen and his girlfriend Jessica Roseberry, who is also a cop, were both in uniform and working in the West Philly's 18th District last Friday when the assault unfolded. Roseberry, an 18-year-old veteran of the force, was injured during the assault. Ramsey said, but the extent of those injuries were unclear. According to court records, Roseberry filed a federal lawsuit against the city in July alleging that she'd been called a bitch after she declined to go out on a date with a supervisor. She also claimed that she faced retaliation for a prior lawsuit that she filed against the city after narcotics cops searched her house in 2010 without a warrant. Oh yeah, that sounds a lot like she's doing the same false allegation against her boyfriend now, doesn't it? She's got a pattern of behavior of false allegations against people. Maybe. Maybe. Nasty. So, let's see what else I can scrounge up here. We've got about uh, 18 minutes or so to go. Um... Lots of ISIS. ISIS stuff, yeah, ISIS video, British hostages beheaded now, they're saying. Tons of ISIS stuff, the FBI wants you to fear everything, so it can sell you a whole bunch of protection in Leviticus. Just absolutely, just profound, uh, what these monsters do over and over and over and over and over again. I mean, it just, it never fails. So, um... It's a plague. They're just a plague. It's always been a plague, and now we're going to get rid of this plague. Now, this morning, um, Bo put out uh, a new video over on Bono's Entertainment on uh, uh, some breaking news of the graves of Irish Republican Army victims that had been long hidden, and um, going back to the FBI Bureau and all of these things. Again, the IRA was also the FBI. Uh, as much as Al-Qaeda was the FBI, Viet Cong was the FBI, um, all of these things. And, and it's written in the church committee reports. You know, we talk a lot about 
uh, Book 4, Supplementary Detailed Staff Reports on Foreign Military Intelligence, wherein uh, the CIA basically says, look, we're, we're a production company. Well, book 2 is on um, assassinations and all of these things, uh, including uh, rights of Americans and um, the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King who was assassinated by the FBI and Coretta Scott King and family members won the civil suit against the federal government and, and of course it was civil so then everybody's all hushed up and, and uh, there's gay orders in place otherwise the American populace would actually have realized by now that the FBI assassinates all of us uh, their target is human and this has been so since the 1947 National Security Act, guaranteeing corporate welfare at the expense of, of course, human beings having been declared the enemy of the state by action of Congress. And um, this is coming to a close. Uh, it, it'll all be over really soon, folks. Uh, keep hanging on and, and knowing uh, and that the public law, you know, it's it's the truth. It's the word of God. Uh, we're not here for accolade. We're not here to be seen of men. We're here to uh, obtain accountability for this onslaught against humanity throughout time by action of politics. It's stemming from the word polycratis, meaning to control or possess many. And in this, uh, they will be held accountable, each and every one, according to their wor works. From the Telegraph this week, telegraph.co.uk, Lancia editor apologizes for Gaza article by Ku Klux Klan link scientists. They have done this throughout history. Congress seeds a entity or a place of business or a CIA production with extremists and the greatest uh, evidentiary trail go back to the Democrat Simmons that picked up the KKK the second time and promoted it which gave it its start back in the 1920s and of course it was the same Democrats that came in in the 60s with affirmative action and all of these other programs that were never necessary because it was always the FBI killing blacks, killing females, killing kids. And, and, and of course, you know, we, I refer back to at the beginning of the show the definition of bureau, the definition of cabal, the definitions of cartels, and who the actors are, really. And uh, at the core of everything, of course, it's always been Congress, the Lord God, uh, your transgressor. And as these things go away and you feel this lift of, of the weight upon you, um, it'll just get better and better. It's been keeping us busy, but uh, not for very much longer. Yeah. We didn't cover any entertainment news. I see here just recently Charlie Sheen is now being sued over an incident at the dentist. Uh, let's see, in the Ebola news, of course, we had that diagnosis in um, Texas, now the first one. Uh, just, just an update here. It looks like uh, family is... Uh, it says the headline reads, Family Leaves Dallas Home Where Ebola Patient Stayed. Right. The exposure on this one. I mean, the, the, the U.S. government, the U.S. Incorporated, dropped the ball so bad on this one. It's horrifying what they've done this time. Yeah, it says a hazardous materials crew on Friday decontaminated the Texas apartment where an Ebola patient was staying when he got sick. And hours later, the family that was living in the apartment was moved to a private residence in a gated community that was offered by a volunteer. Family of our uh, four was seen being led from the apartment late Friday afternoon. They were placed in 
A Dallas County deputy's patrol car and driven away. Their destination was unknown. Family was placed in Dallas County deputies. Okay, uh, our hope is that they can have some peace and that they can be left alone for a few days at least in that undisclosed, undisclosed location, said Dallas County Judge Clay Jenkins. And our hope is that the people who live around the apartment complex that they were in, that their lives can get back to normal. And I guess that is if there's not an Ebola break out there. Right. And that, the, the U.S. government, it looks like it, it's trying to help, but... Uh, again, you know, look at where this latest outbreak stemmed from, and uh, you'd be surprised. It is the U.S. government again, and again, and again, and again. And it's like, it never ends until it ends. Until they're held accountable, they're going to keep playing these games and, and um, having these little, quote, oopsies. You know, they know exactly what they're doing. Let's see if I got any other important news. I'm sure a lot of stuff out there this week. It was just, uh, man, overwhelming with all the arrests, indictments, and hot water. Well, Biden, Everybody seems to be in. Joseph Biden, the uh, president of the Senate, and of course the vice president himself, has been uh, quoted as saying they did not want to do that. Biden says U.S. pushed EU into sanctioning Russia. And um, it's been interesting to watch him the last couple of days as well as he approaches um I don't know what this is. It looks like he's going to roll over on a whole bunch of folks and point the finger everywhere else except for at himself. And again, to all of the potential fall guys, uh, the evidence of his criminal activity are, of course, in the congressional acts themselves. And it, it doesn't take much to uh, look and see what he's been doing and what he's been up to. Boy, back in Pennsylvania, man, they just keep <laughs> coming more. I surf around this uh, NBC Philadelphia. Pennsylvania appointee Bucks Corbett's call to step down amid porn scandal. It's Governor Tom Corbett called on one of his political appointees to step down because of his involvement in the scandal over pornography in the state attorney general's office. Uh, in a letter to Corbett, Randy Feathers said Friday he wants Attorney General Kathleen Kane to appoint an independent forensic expert to review emails her office provided to the governor's office. Feathers says he'll consider stepping down from his $116,000 a year seat on the State Board of Probation and Parole if the expert concludes that he did not fulfill his professional responsibilities. Kane's office gave Corbett's office two bound volumes of what she described as inappropriate emails linked to Feathers. Corbett's office has suggested it may seek to remove Feathers from the board. Breaking out of RT America um, today at Texas Detention Center, staff accused of sexual assaults. Central American women being held at a Texas detention center claim that multiple female detainees are being sexually assaulted by guards according to a civil rights group asking for an investigation into the matter. The Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund, MALDEF, has told Secretary of Homeland Security Jay Johnson to investigate, quote, serious allegations of substantial ongoing sexual abuse, end quote, by private prison contractor employees in Carnes County, Texas detention facility. The building is used by the Department of Homeland Security to house women and children immigrant detainees. Many of the women detained in the facility are escaping violence and sexual assault in their home countries in Central America. MALDF has been monitoring the conditions at Carnes as part of that. We have been working with pro bono lawyers who have been handling immigration papers. Not long after the center opened in August, lawyers started receiving reports about strange things going on. 
The complaint alleges that numerous women claim harassment and sexual assault has been going on at the facility since August of 2014. The allegations include, quote, Carn Center personnel removing female detainees from their cell late in the evening and during early morning hours for purpose of engaging in sexual acts in various parts of the facility, personnel calling detainees novias or girlfriends and requesting sexual favors in exchange for money, promising promises of assistance with their pending immigration cases and shelter when and if the women are released and Karn Center guards kissing, fondling, and or groping female detainees in front of other detainees and children. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE, did not immediately respond to RT's request for comments. ICE spokeswoman Adelina Pruneda told Routers, however, that the agency has a zero-tolerance policy for sexual abuse and assault. Quote, individuals in our custody are housed and treated in a safe, secure, and humane manner, she said. If the allegations are confirmed, personnel at the Karn Center will be in violation of the Prison Rape Elimination Act, as well as federal sexual assault and harassment laws. Quote, we haven't heard from ICE yet. We're hoping we will hear soon what actions are being taken to ensure the safety of the women and children, Bono told RT and also what action is being taken to ensure this doesn't happen again. Under the federal law, the facility is supposed to have a policy for prevention and immediate response to these types of reports, and we are concerned whether or not one exists. We haven't been able to find out, but also whether one exists, whether it is being implemented improperly. Women have already notified supervisors at the center of these alleged crimes, which are said to involve four detainees, but no steps have been taken to stop or prevent the abuse by at least three Carn Center employees, according to Bono. And we'll have updates on that as they become available. Uh, looks like the CIA is sued now over Senate spying. Did you see that one? Yeah, we knew that was coming. It's Diane yeah, Feinstein. Yeah. We is talked about it. Director, yeah, and it's a while back. Yeah. But it's yeah, it looks like it's uh it's uh it's coming down the pike here. Absolutely. Uh, so Washington based private organization is suing the CIA to obtain details about how it's spy on the Senate staffers. Right. The Electronic Privacy Information Center filed a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit to obtain the agency inspector general's report on the spying incident and announced on Thursday. Well, wouldn't it be nice to see it all laid out exactly what the, it was all about? Absolutely, you know, and, and that's what needs to occur um, as all things are revealed in their own ways. And, and I think they're going to see what we were talking about then, about how, you know, Diane Feinstein herself directed it. Right. Right, and continues, you know, the Senate Judiciary Committee is, is part of that um, across the board, and then you get down to the lower levels, and then you see the CSI, you know, it, it's top to bottom, one big house of gown, the marquee. <laughs> we yeah, can just tell them everything, and they're just going to forget it anyway. Yeah, so I it, I kind of like picture the thing going down, well, it wasn't me, Diane Feinstein. It was that Diane Feinstein over there. And then the camera rolls over to the other Diane Feinstein with the different hat on. Right. <laughs> or, or the poor, poor I mean, that, fall guy, which is what that story was about. Right? Right. Going after the CIA operatives and, and agents is not going after their directors. And um, that's what I would like to see more than anything. You know, you look at the... Uh, Senate Intelligence Committee, and, and you'll find out right away who the directors are and who's maintaining these these uh, productions, like uh, the Bundy Ranch uh, production and, and such. Yeah, let's see the enterovirus thing now. Here's claimed a couple of Colorado adults. And I saw one Pennsylvania child, too, that said over on that uh, NBC website, 
I've seen some of that, and um, I'm, I'm still watching and, and um, you know, waiting to see what kind of pattern exists and, and uh, that type of thing. And, and uh, so far, I haven't got a beat on it. Junk bonds begin to wobble, smacking down one company at a time. Been watching that one. Yeah, a lot of them are taking a hit right now, and it's it's very interesting to see. And why Ben Bernanke can't refinance his mortgage. I think that is my favorite one of this week, if not my favorite of all time. <laughs> and that is in your Leaving the Farm from yesterday, which you have posted over on YouTube now, so folks can go over there and listen to that. Yeah, and that's our time. Do you have any parting words? No, I think, as the song says, that just about does it, don't it? Yeah, and those are the grim facts. How about some Alice Cooper to take us on out? Be well, everybody. Be well, see you, bye.